Now let's all prepare ourselves as we listen to the message this morning. The Lord's army, whose God, based from Joshua 5, verses 13 to 15. And I'll give you Pastor Noel Espinosa. Now, it is supposed to be the season of the UN General Assembly. That is the time of the year when leaders of member states gather in the United Nations, that's in New York, to make speeches and share their view of the world. Now, those heads of state are indeed making speeches. In fact, our president has already done his. Only there is no real assembly. Speeches are being delivered virtually and we all know why, and that is because of COVID-19. Now, these are supposedly very powerful people. They are under guard 24-7, but they are not immune from the virus, and thus they themselves must keep distance. Now, let me tell you, there is something worse than the virus in terms of contagion and consequence, and that is sin. But let me tell you that the news of the gospel is that the all-powerful one, God himself, did not keep his distance. He came down to man. He came down to mankind. And that is what we call in its most permanent form, the incarnation of the Son of God in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That makes him a real permanent Savior because he came down. He became God-man. And he is your only hope because there is no other God-man except the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he is still not your Savior, may you come to him now and make the Lord Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior because he is your only hope. Now, not simply from this virus, but from that greater, uh, greater danger of sin. That's the incarnation. But before the incarnation... There has been times, there had been times when God appeared in visible form temporarily. In theology, we call that theophany, God appearing. And we are studying one such theophany, and that is Joshua's encounter with someone who introduced himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. And the reason why we are studying this, my burden is to show that the lesson learned in that encounter is relevant today. It is applicable to the church because as I have maintained, right, biblical theology should see the church as fulfilling what was promised to Israel in the old covenant. That does not violate what God promised to Israel because whatever he promised to Israel, uh, these are being fulfilled among the Jews, even from New Testament times, except that what is new is that even Gentiles are now recipients of those promises. And in fact, uh, ultimately, uh, the church will become predominantly Gentile because the Israelites, by and large, rejected the Messiah. But the blessings will come to them as well. So it is in this light that we are doing this brief series of our passage this month, but applying this to our church. So for one last time, in this series, I would invite you to turn to Joshua chapter 5, and we will read again verses 13 to 15. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And it says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, this is an account that reports a significant turning point to the nation of Israel. They have set foot on the land of Canaan. Remember, Canaan is the promised land. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they now are in the promised land. And they are about to make conquest 
of the land because the land was not theirs for the taking. The land was peopled by many, many inhabitants under the umbrella category of the Canaanites and they need to make conquest of these peoples in the land. As they are about to make conquest of the land, this was when the encounter happened, as it was when Joshua was surveying the terrain of Jericho, because Jericho was going to be the first city that will be conquered by the Israelites. And as he was doing that survey, there the encounter happened. And the first question of Joshua about this character that he encountered was to know whether this character was on their side or against their side. As I've said, that is a very natural way of asking and inquiring when you are in a war mode. Uh, when you are about to do battle against the enemies, you want to know if this particular person is on your side or on the other side, friend or foe. But instead, Joshua received a mystifying answer. The character said, no, that is no to your question. It is not your concern that uh, whose side God is. The point is you must be on the side of God. And th that was our first message. God's servant must seek to be on God's side, not God on his side. And then our attention focused on the character's self-introduction. How did the character introduce himself? He said, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And again, applying this to the church, I said as a message that the church must be under the Lord's command to be a divine force in the world. Now, what happens next is full of meaning, not only for Joshua, but for the Israelites. And of course, in application to the church because we find Joshua ending up with worshiping the commander of the army of the Lord. That gives away his real identity. This is a theophany. That God is using visible form in order to appear, in this case, to a particular individual, that of Joshua. And the response of Joshua upon recognizing that was to worship the Lord. And if we apply this to the church, I think the message should be clear. And my message is the church is to pursue its mission in the world from the posture of worship of God. Dapat gampanan ng iglesia ang kanyang misyon sa mundo sa postura ng pagsamba sa Diyos. The church is to pursue its mission in the world from the posture of worship of God. Now, it is very significant that this encounter will precede any military operation by the Israelites in Canaan. Before any battle, this encounter needed to happen. And Joshua is acting on behalf of Israel. And this same posture now applies to the church. Before any battle, before anything to be done, as a matter of mission by the church, we must be invited to, as Joshua was, in the posture of worship. And this posture of worship, as in the case of Joshua, the posture of worship by the church is really the encounter of two realities. First is humble attitude of servanthood, ang mababang loob na ang bababang kalooban ng pagiging lingkod. Humble attitude of servanthood and secondly, divine attribute of holiness. Ang katangian ng Diyos na kabanalan. The divine attribute of holiness when these two meet. Servanthood of, this, of, of the worshiper and the holiness of God, the result is the posture of worship. So let us consider here first the humble attitude of servanthood. When Joshua asked his first question, are you for us or for our adversary? 
Are you friend or foe? That was a warrior's question. He was ready for war. And he wanted to know whether this individual is friend or foe. But upon realizing that he was in the presence of deity, he was in the presence of God no less, his question suddenly changed. The question is, what does my Lord say to his servant? So Joshua changed from battle mode to service mode. This is not about fighting, though he will fight later on. This is about being a servant to the Lord because this character is no less than God. And from being general of his troops, ready for battle, ready to issue his command, Joshua is now reduced to a servant waiting for the Lord's command. What does my Lord say to his servant? We see here that humble servanthood to God waits for God's direction for mission. Ang mababang loob na paglilingkod sa Diyos ay naghihintay ng kanyang patnubay sa anumang misyon. Humble servanthood to God waits for God's direction for mission. Joshua, from the moment we encounter him in the biblical records, he has been a warrior. The first time we read of him is when Israel had its first battle after exiting from Exodus. Their first battle was with the Amalekites. And who was to lead the battle to victory? Well, Joshua was the leader. And that's how we first encounter the character of Joshua. And then when, G when Moses was sending 12 spies to Canaan in order to survey the land, when they were in Kadesh Barnea, he would send 12 spies, one of whom would be Joshua. And you know the story when the 12 spies returned, the 10 spies were cowardly, they did not want to proceed to Canaan. And it was only Joshua and Caleb who were courageous enough to say, we can conquer the land. But the opinion of the ten prevailed. And that explains the 40 years in the wilderness. But as a reward, it was only Joshua and Caleb among all those who exited from Egypt who would enter the promised land. All the rest were born in the wilderness. So from the moment that we encounter Joshua, he has been a warrior. And that is why when Moses was about to die, he gave a charge to Joshua. And the charge constitutes with these repeated words in Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 7, be strong and courageous. So this was really Joshua. He was known for his strength. He was known for his courage. And what God promised to him was precisely those characters of strength and courage. But when you think of the characters of strength and courage, they are hardly to be associated with servanthood. You know, when we think of a servant, by definition, he is one under command. And for as long as we could find Joshua in the biblical records, he was in command militarily. Second to Moses, when Moses was alive, but he was always in command. Now, when he encountered the commander of the army of the Lord, he was to be himself under command. A servant, by definition, is one inferior to another. But that was something you cannot associate with Joshua, except that he was in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, he could not take any other posture than that of servanthood. And his question summarizes the real attitude of the servant. What does my Lord say? What is, my, what is the instruction of my Lord? 
We are prepared for battle. We have made our plans. And I am now surveying the terrain of Jericho, how best to execute our plan. But all these plans are nothing unless you first give me the instruction. You are God. You are the commander. I am servant. Now give me your direction. So servanthood waits for the direction of God. And this is not an attitude that is encouraged today. Ours is an age, a generation that is not made to wait. Our generation is one that must invent and innovate and initiate, make it instant if need be, but we cannot wait. What characterizes the spirit of this lack of servanthood is pragmatism. You know, what works? Never mind if it is not consistent with the Word of God. But if it works, who can argue with success? That's the slogan of the pragmatist. The key word today is being effective, not faithful. But that is different from the attitude of servanthood. I'm sure when Joshua made the plans with his fellow leaders, they were very careful. They planned what would be militarily effective. But in the presence of God as a servant, all those plans are to be taken aside. And Joshua had to say, what does my Lord say? To his servant. We have heard of the space race during the 60s and then the arms race during the 70s and 80s. Today we're hearing of vaccine race and there are those who will sacrifice protocol testing for safety because they are after profit. They want to be ahead of the rest and they will skip all the protocols just to be ahead of others, and that compromises safety. That's pragmatism. And that has no place in the mission that God has entrusted to the church. But how do we show our servanthood to God? Well, this is the challenge that we draw from Joshua's response. Make worship the vital expression of your servanthood to God. Gawin mong ang pagsama ang nagpapahayag ng iyong pagiging lingkod ng Diyos. Now, this became a test to Joshua in what God instructed to him concerning their approach to Jericho. I'm sure Joshua, as I've said, had made plans that would be militarily effective in their approach to Jericho, the first conquest. But what the Israelites were asked to do to, was to go around the city seven times. And then on the seventh roundabout, they were to sound the trumpet of victory. No fighting of swords, just going around praising God and then sound the trumpet of victory. I mean, what kind of battle plan was that? If that was done today's, in today's warfare, the commander will face court-martial. But this is the first conquest. In the other battles, in the subsequent battles, the Israelites will, will do more conventional battles. But Jericho being the first conquest, the Lord is teaching the Israelites about the principle of victory. Victory comes from God. God gives victory to people who are servants. And you are a servant, first and foremost, expressing it in worship. So the commander who revealed himself to Joshua is said to have a drawn sword. Now, it would have been very easy for Joshua to imitate it and draw his own sword. But it is not a drawn sword that is the first thing that God looks from those he sends in a mission. 
not a drawn sword, but bended knees in worship and prayer to Him, to acknowledge Him. And just a month before entering the promised land, it was then that Moses addressed the nation, which would be recorded as our book of Deuteronomy. And he said this in Deuteronomy 20, verses 3 and 4, Hear, O Israel, you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is He who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. So there, Moses is telling them, Seek your victory from God for all your mission of conquest in Canaan and for the church whose conquest is no longer by sword and is broader than Canaan because it is now the world, but the same, the same principle is applied. That victory comes from the Lord and the most courageous of mission workers, the most courageous of gospel witnesses, and the most courageous of church members are those who are in habit of genuine worship of God. They are the servants. And the reason for our generation, while being so innovative, yet lacking in backbone when it comes to doctrine and the word of God, is because there is very little worship. So I'm asking you, how is your servanthood to God? I mean, you have your measures of accomplishment in your service in other fields. But what about serving God? Is it instinctive for you to await as Joshua with words, what does my Lord say? I am considering this path of career. What does my Lord say? I am considering this relationship. What does my Lord say? I am considering this particular decision. What does my Lord say? Is that your question in the posture of worship? And that's when you will be afforded help from God. Help that you cannot see in tangible ways, but help nonetheless. John Bunyan, in his Pilgrim's Progress, one of, his, one of his characters in part two of the Pilgrim's Progress is valiant for truth. And along the way to the celestial city, he met three foes whom he defeated. And then when he met another character on the way to the celestial city named Mr. Great Heart, Mr. Great Heart asked him, why did you not cry for help? And Mr. Valiant for Truth said, I did. I cried for help. I called to my king and he sent invisible help. Well, that is what we need. And that is what those who do not know the place and centrality of worship of God will not have. They may have help in their resources but not the invisible help of god because it takes servanthood it takes a man a woman who can ask the question what does my lord say so there's humble servanthood but what the joshua met and encountered and what we should meet and encounter in our posture of worship secondly is divine attribute of holiness Ang Katangian ng Diyos sa kanyang kabanalan. What would you expect the commander to tell Joshua as the first thing to do? Prepare your armor? Polish your sword? No. The commander says, take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy. And this gives away the character to be no less than God himself because he is demanding worship due to holiness. This teaches us that God's holiness invites 
reverence and purity of approach to God. Kung tayo ay lalapit sa Diyos, kailangan natin ng banal na takot at kadalisayan ng ating panloob sa kanyang harapan. We see here Joshua made two gestures that depict the right approach to God in worship. Not physically, but internally. The first gesture was, we are told, he, Joshua, fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Now, that is reverence. Reverence means consciousness of the presence of one who is above you. Exalted. Not one to trivialize. Not to make fun with. Not someone you can just treat as cool. God is exalted. And that loneliness and reverence are missing in many that still consider their gatherings as worship. God is treated like one's dance partner. And you see this in changed addresses to God and prayers to God where being friends with God seem to be the in thing. But the second gesture is even more significant what was required of Joshua by the commander of the Lord's army is remove your sandals because the land you are standing upon is holy. Now, the act of removing the sandals is still a practice in Mediterranean and Oriental cultures. We've lost much of the Oriental culture because we are Americanized. But in Mediterranean and Oriental cultures, it is a recognition that the sandals having been soiled out of respect before you enter the house of your host. You remove your footwear and leave them by the door. That's respect for the place of the host. And that shows us what is happening here. When Joshua was told to remove his sandals, he must recognize that this land does not belong to him, even if he will have it by conquest, the land belongs by creation and by redemption to God. And that makes the land holy. Not that the land itself in its content is holy, but the presence of God makes it holy. And the only response to that is to be conscious of one's impurity and by the grace of God seek cleansing from that impurity so that we may be acceptable to God. Oh, Joshua would have, would have known of this same experience of Moses in the burning bush when Moses was also told to remove his sandals as he saw this flaming bush who revealed himself as I am who I am, the Lord himself. But there's an important difference. When Moses had his encounter, he was a mere shepherd, a nobody. He escaped from Egypt, remember, and he was then tending the ship. He was a nobody asking to remove his sandals because the land was holy. But Joshua is in a different status when this encounter happened. He was general. He was leader of the nation. But even he, in the presence of God, must be conscious of his impurity and must remove his sandals and be cleansed in the presence of God. This is not appreciated today because the attribute of God's holiness is an almost lost discourse in our day. So much is said of the love of God, of His goodness and giving. But remember in the scriptures, holy defines everything of God. There is nothing of God that you cannot describe as holy. You cannot say that wrath is a loving wrath. But it is right to speak of a holy wrath of God. Everything in God is holy. And you know what? It is holiness that is called the beauty of God. It is that which should make God attractive to us. 
And the only way that can happen is when we know grace in purifying us because we cannot purify ourselves of our own sins. And a church that will accomplish its mission is required to begin at this most basic of God's attribute. He is so exalted because He is holy while we are lowly and impure. And we cannot be eye to eye to Him. We must bow down in worship. Now, you may have heard of Marco Polo. He was the first Westerner with his company to have audience with the Chinese emperor. And because they were Westerners, they were so tall. And in the presence of the Chinese emperor, they were taller. They were forced to kneel down because no one was allowed to be taller than the emperor. Well, of course, that is just hubris and trying to make a delusion. But in the case of God, it is not a delusion. We cannot be eye to eye to Him. We cannot be a match to Him. He is holy and we are impure. And that is the very defining atmosphere of worship. So I challenge you, let your worship be primarily responsive to the holiness of God. Hayaan mo ang pagsamba mo ay pagtugon sa kabanala ng Diyos. You may want to speak and think about the love of God. Nothing wrong with that. You may want to think of God's generosity. Again, nothing wrong with that. He has lavished us. But remember in that very text, what He lavished is His grace. Because we are sinners. And when you think first of the holiness of God before anything else, you will see that you cannot stand alone by yourself before this God. You need a mediator. And if I'm speaking to anyone there who thinks that you have an audience with God because you are righteous, you are moral, you have a religion or anything else with which you think God can accept you by yourself, you are deluded, you are blinded. God is holy and an impure sinner like you and me has no chance being accepted by this holy God until you come to Him to, through the only one by whom you can be accepted, and that is Jesus Christ, the mediator. Come to Him and be saved. And there you will find acceptance with God. And you will appreciate that the best provision of God ever for sinners is not material, but salvation. And then you will attain, and when you're a Christian, you will retain a conviction of your impurity that in the presence of God, you always want to begin with cleansing, with forgiveness. And churches today are so immersed in methodology and gimmickry to accomplish whatever they think their mission is. Our mission is to represent God in our Canaan, as the Israelites were except that our Canaan is no longer that piece of land in the Middle East. Our Canaan is the world, and we must represent God's side. And when we do, we must be worshipers first. And worship must not be thought of primarily as singing and dancing with gusto for God. God is holy. And those of us coming to Him are impure because of sin. Our only hope is our sins are removed in Christ. And that is what our identity should be before our busyness and occupation with methods. We must first worship. You know, you know that expression, don't just stand there. Do something. Well, we can reverse that in this case. Don't just do something. Stand in worship before you do anything. And many Christians try to compensate their lack of worship by being busy, busy, busy in their activities, but no pause. 
The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And years later, when Joshua was old, ready to die, how will he define his legacy? Not as a warrior. Warrior all his life. But because of this encounter towards the end, you all know, or most of you should know, chapter 24, 15 of Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is the Hebrew form of what in the New Testament will be the name of Jesus. We have one greater than Joshua, and that is the Lord Jesus. All the more reason why the church should be a worshiping church, and it begins with holiness. You may have heard, I'm sure, of Aiden Wilson Tozer, known to all his readers as A.W. Tozer. He died in 1963 in Toronto, Canada. He was a man of insight, seeing so much that was wrong of the Christianity of his time because of lack of worship. And he wrote books, published his addresses, calling the church back to its primary posture of worship. Perhaps his best well-known book is The Knowledge of the Holy. And that shows you his main burden. The reason why the church, even then in the 60s, were not anymore the worshiping church that it should be, is they have lost the knowledge of the holy. Let us restore that. And as we venture on our mission, let us do so in the posture of worship. It is easy and more adventurous to think of being warriors first. Let's change that. We are worshipers first. And worshiper of the holy, whose only hope is that there is that one who is the way for our approach to our God. As our last hymn would put it, this, uh, the Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God, this, this prepares for the sight of holiness above. The sons of ignorance and night may dwell in the eternal light through the eternal love.